Hi everyone. Good morning, and uh, and happy Dashera to everyone who is celebrating, and for those who have made time to come on to this webinar despite the fact that it's a festive weekend. Thank you so much for making that time. So just to let you know a little bit about why we do this and what this is about. So the Outside In Ecology series, um, as the name suggests, is um, a series of talks that uh, is aimed at, well, subjects on ecology. And we have got speakers from the Bangalore Life Science Cluster as well as beyond uh, now. And the series was conceptualized by uh, Professor Sardamani, who is here on the call with us. Um, and since then, we've worked with her uh, at the communications office to bring this uh, to life um, on a weekly basis. And uh, so without any further ado, I, I'd want to um, hand this over to uh, Sardamani to introduce our speaker. Um, from the conversation we had just before the call started, I think we're going to have a really interesting session this morning. So yeah, just hang in there and, and listen uh, to the stories about fantastic beasts. Over to you, Sodamni. Yeah, thank you, Mahin. Uh, may I request uh, Professor Umar Ramakrishnan to introduce the speaker, please? Thanks, Sodamni. Thanks uh, everyone for being here. Uh, my name is Uma uh, and I work at NCBS. Uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Arjun Srivatsa who's uh, been uh, someone who's been interested in working on uh, wildlife and uh, canids in particular for many years now. So Arjun uh, is actually uh, someone we have known for a while. So we take him, tend to take him for granted, but uh, he's, uh, he's worked in the Western Ghats um, and uh, across India now uh, uh, on canids uh, for most of his career. Arjun did his, uh, he's from Bangalore and he, uh, so that hopefully uh, is nice to know. And uh, he was at Christ uh, University and then did a master's at the uh, NCBS uh, uh, WCS uh, Wildlife Biology Conservation Program. Uh, and then subsequently did a PhD um, in the University of Florida and has just returned um, you know, to, to think about uh, future research uh, and conservation of, of canids. Arjun is uh, single-handedly responsible for about half uh, the publications and knowledge on whole. I mean, this is really exceptional. Uh, the Asiatic wild dog, which you'll hear more about from him, uh, is something which uh, he has shed light on uh, to the world. So uh, without much further, um, you know, blah, blah, uh, really excited. Of course, Arjun is an excellent communicator, which I hope you'll see, uh, a cartoonist, an artist, and many other things apart from uh, the scientific work that he does, which he blends all of this in. Uh, these different aspects of communication into his work. So uh, look forward to hearing from you, Arjun, and thanks all of you for being here. Mm, should I go ahead and share my screen? Yes, please do. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for um, for tuning in and being part of this on a Sunday morning <laughs> during um, a very busy festival season. Uh, my name is Arjun Srivatsa. I'm uh, a research associate with the Wildlife Conservation Society India. Um, so just uh, my one line um, brief basically is that I usually tell people uh, I'm a carnivore biologist. Um, so most of my work involves studying wild animals out, uh, in the outdoors and then Sort of trying to figure out various things about them. Uh, but when I say carnivores, what exactly do I mean? Um, so uh, carnivores are basically animals whose main diet um, consists of meat. Um, so they have evolved, this group of animals have evolved uh, to sort of um, in different mechanisms that allow them to sort of cut and tear through meat and eat flesh. Um, and this is basically like a very short, uh, like a snapshot of the kind of diversity of carnivores that we have. We have animals of the cat family, of the dog family, of uh, hyenas, for example, or bears. So all of these animals together constitute carnivores. And these are the species that I'm interested in studying. In India, uh, when we talk of carnivores, usually we generally think of the tiger, right? Because I mean, it's ti the tiger is the world's most 
famous and also the world's most favorite animal. Uh, but India has a very, very wide diversity of carnivores. Um, we have the snow leopard uh, up high up in the um, Himalayas. Um, and in the Western dry forest, we have the Asiatic lion. In the dry forests of much of India, we have the sloth bear. Um, in the wet Western Ghats, we have the highly endemic Nilgiri marten, which is uh, found only here and nowhere else in the world. Uh, we have the Asiatic wild dog or the dhol, the golden jackal, which is uh, the most widespread carnivore found uh, across much of India. The Indian wolf in the dry grasslands of central India. The Tibetan wolf up in the Himalayas again the Indian fox, which is found in a diversity of habitats across India, including many grasslands and agricultural fields. The red fox, again, high up in the Himalayas. The desert fox in Gujarat, Rajasthan, the, 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 the extremely dry parts of it. The Tibetan fox, which is found in parts of uh, Jammu Kashmir and, and in Sikkim. And the striped hyena, which is again found across a variety of habitats across the country. Uh, this is of course just a short glimpse, but it's very interesting for me that India actually has 23% of all carnivore species found in the world, all terrestrial or land carnivores. And what makes it even more interesting is that India just constitutes 2.3% of the global land area. So which means it's a very, very tiny piece of area in which there's such a diversity and really high numbers of these carnivores. And what makes it even more fascinating is that these carnivores share space with 1.3 billion people. And that's a lot of people. And this is rarely seen anywhere else in the world. And that makes this entire concept extremely interesting for me to study. So when I say 1.3 billion people, a lot of the times it's very hard to imagine what that would be like, right? And so we are talking about a population density of about 400 people per square kilometers on average. And that is a huge number. And when I say it's on average, it means that there are some places, for example, cities like Bangalore and Mumbai, where the number goes up to around 30,000 people per square kilometer. So that's a lot of people and it's very crowded and it's a huge population. And this huge population is also obviously interested in um, wanting to make their lives better, right? So we want big infrastructure, we want roads, we want highways, we want airports. Uh, we want cars and vehicles to move around. So all of this sort of is the central interest of a lot of developing countries just like India. So when you have a lot of carnivores and then you have a lot of people and a lot of development all trying to, co uh, to sort of coexist, sometimes what happen happens is that we are bound to sort of run into each other and sometimes this turns into negative interactions. So here's a picture of a leopard. Um, killing a, a cow, somebody's cow. Uh, and this is on some highway and and like the traffic has come to a, a standstill and then they're taking pictures. And this is sort of a negative interaction because somebody is losing their cow. So when this happens, it sort of uh, escalates into people viewing these animals negatively. Um, and that sometimes has very bad consequences for wildlife, um, carnivores in particular. So with this overall context of what it's how important carnivores are uh, in India because there's such a diversity of them. They're so important for the uh, for the ecosystem uh, and the fact that we have so many people and and uh, we are a developing nation who uh, viewing uh, like great infrastructure development and becoming a developed country as we move forward. So how do we sort of conserve these carnivores in this sort of a context? Um, so as a conservation scientist, um, have been working on um, different aspects of carnivore ecology and their conservation that sort of helps us better understand them. Um, so if we say save the tiger or if we say save the leopard, what exactly do we mean? So how do you save them? So a lot of these things are answered by asking scientific questions. Uh, and then uh, that sort of leads the way into um, us figuring out what are the actions that are required in order to save them and their population, right? Um, so instead of just going on about all the research work that I've done just as a run of the mill uh, talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these cartoons of these carnivores 
uh, to tell you stories about the re- uh, about all the research work that I have done. Again, I will uh, sort of um, flag here that uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, a very small part of carnivore conservation research in India. This has just this pertains just to my talk. Uh, of course, there are a lot more people, a lot of really cool biologists who are doing amazing work. Uh, what I'm discussing today is limited to the kind of work that I have been involved in. So with that, uh, I'm going to start with talking about leopards. Uh, leopards are super awesome, cool cats. Uh, they're in fact, I think they're the coolest cats, um, wild cats at least. Um, they're, uh, they're absolutely amazing because uh, they live in such a wide diversity of habitats. Sometimes like people don't even imagine that they can live in these places, but they do. Um, of course, sometimes this uh, can have negative consequences, but not all the time. Uh, so we need to understand uh, these um, interactions better in order to be able to figure out how and where to conserve leopards. So to start off, where exactly are leopards found? So like I said, they're found in such a diversity of habitats. People have spotted them crossing big highways, major roads, like I showed you the picture before, uh, where it was attacking a cow on some big main road. Um, they're, they've been spotted in like farmlands, for example. On the top right, you can see there's a, there's a leopard hiding in um, a scarecrow. Um, they're found uh, on top of uh, village huts, uh, on rooftops, uh, like you see on the bottom left. Uh, and in fact, they're also found in fairly high numbers in big cities like Mumbai and in Bangalore. So they're pretty versatile as far as carnivores are concerned. Um, so if they're all over the place, do we read about them? How often are they in the news? Uh, it turns out quite a bit. Um, so uh, if you look at how frequently uh, leopards are reported in the newspaper, it's pretty shocking because uh, people and leopards have always lived alongside each other for a very long time now. But recently with sort of everybody having cell phone access and now we want to have news channels and uh, newspapers that we feed us news like 24 seven. So there's a lot of um, sort of uh, an attempt at wanting to make, uh, bring sensational news. Uh, so and having leopards close to people definitely makes for sensational news. So you see a lot of information, uh, a lot of news reports on leopards uh, just in human habitations. Sometimes these are negative interactions like where they've probably attacked um, cows, livestock, um, or like sometimes people as well, but most of the time it just happens to be seen somewhere. Um, here you can see like a collage of uh, newspaper clippings that report um, leopards being seen again in completely uh, or at least in partially human use areas, right? Like in village outskirts or some big main road or in a farmland, uh, cubs being spotted in farms and all of that. So now as scientists, since there is so much information about leopards, where they are found, what they were doing, all of that in these newspapers, we wanted to know if there's any way we can use this information to sort of find out a little bit more about these leopards. Uh, so can we do that? So what we did was in Karnataka, uh, where I'm from, uh, we spent about a year uh, collecting all the newspaper articles in English and in Canada, which is the local regional language here. Uh, and sort of looking at these news reports for a period of one year. Uh, we used both English and Canada newspapers, like I said. Uh, and the black lines that you see inside Karnataka here are the taluks or the uh, sub-districts. So we wanted to sort of map them also. So we wanted to see where are these lepers found, what is happening with them, uh, um, how, what sort of like interactions they have with people, is there a lot of attack on uh, on livestock and on people, So and, and why is that happening if, if at all there is a pattern to it. So what, what did we find? So our first question was, where are they found and how much of the area in Karnataka do they, they actually occupy, right? So what we found was that leopards occupy around 50%, like close to 50% of the entire state of Karnataka and mostly outside our traditional protected areas like national parks and sanctuaries. Um, what we also found was that they're generally found uh, more in, a, in those taluks that had a lot of forest cover, uh, that had a lot of tall crops like sugarcane because it, it provides um, cover for them and like they can hide during the day and also it's easy for them to uh, sort of like stay away from the view of people. 
they also occurred a lot more in places that had rocky outcrops because these are ideal denning locations for them and uh, they were also found in in higher chance there was higher chance of finding a leopard in those taluks that had a lot of stray dogs because these leopards are mostly eating stray dogs right that's their main source of food in most of these places so and all of this information uh, about where these leopards were found and how we did this uh, sort of mapping exercise all of that information came from newspapers the second part of it is we wanted to see if there's any pattern any spatial pattern about where the attacks on livestock or on people are happening and why so we found that uh, about 34% of the taluk as opposed to 50% where they occur uh, had some sort of uh, information on um, negative interactions where leopards attack people or attack livestock mostly livestock uh, again uh, attacks mostly happened when the taluk had a lot of tall crops so which in indicates that they were all incidental attacks so like when people ran into them by mistake in a sugar cane field usually that is when uh, the attacks would happen um, it also correlated or rather more attacks would happen in places that had a lot of stray dogs so even though there the attack is on people or on livestock uh, what is driving it is the fact that there are so many stray dogs in that place that there, there's a good population of leopard and likely once in a while there's a negative interaction between them and people and therefore there are attacks interestingly what we also found was there were a lot of chances of attacks in those taluks that had a lot of leopard capture when i say leopard capture i mean when the forest department physically removes the leopard from the place you know by setting up a cage because people are scared people have seen the animal for a while and it has attacked a cow or something and then they remove so every time this has this happened there's a higher chance of attack now why exactly does that happen so and then that's putting a cage and moving the leopard which is called translocation or translocating uh, when that happens does that work and why are there more attacks in those places so it turns out like i said leopards are extremely cool so when you when you capture a leopard from a particular area even if it's a completely like non forest if it's a farmland that has only tall crops if you capture and move it away from there and put put it in some random forest either it will come back to its original home because they have very strong homing tendencies or if it's too far away and it has no chance of coming back because these areas have so many leopards around some other leopard will come and occupy the same area so and since a new leopard occupies the same area it's not aware of its surrounding as much as the previous leopard was and therefore there are poten there is potential for higher chances of uh, it attacking people or livestock um, like cows right okay? so th these sort of activities that sort of take leopards and uh, move it from here and there and and move it from one forest to the other move it from farmland to the forest it usually does not help reduce conflict so if that's the problem then then what is the solution right like what do we do about it um one of the potential options is to shift the focus so every time there is a problem between leopards and people the focus generally is on the leopard about what can we do with the leopard instead by shifting the focus on to people so instead of making it reactive as in after an attack happens uh, trying to deal with the leopard you make it preemptive right so as in you you say uh i'm going to have awareness programs about how people can stay safe uh, how to improve um people's uh infrastructure in the sense that build better shelters for these animals so that uh, at night they are better protected against the leopard uh, about uh, best practices to follow when people are uh, traveling around in these large fields that potentially have leopards sort of like walk around in groups play loud music don't let children walk around alone all of these things so if the focus is moved to people and how to what best practices to follow uh, so that people are safe the livestock is safe then perhaps we are going to be uh, better off in conserving leopard and making sure people are also safe in these areas because then these are not typically forests right these are all outside forest areas and it's completely human use areas uh but if if you if you're saying that there are so many leopards in in these completely human use areas yeah, is the conflict with people the only problem that they have do they face any other issues of course they do so one of the big and the same newspaper reports again helped us figure these things out uh the biggest problem even outside the forest is that they're poached quite a bit um so a lot of the leopard deaths happen because of poaching followed by road kills 
um, because these big highways or even smaller roads, for example, where people are speeding, uh, they hit a crossing leopard and then that's how they die. In some cases, there's retaliation. People are angry because the leopard has attacked somebody in their village or some cow uh, in their village and therefore they kill it in retaliation. Uh, and there's also uh, some cases where leopards died due to other accidents, like they were in, they were close to some village and there was an open well, they fell into the well and died, or a building that was under construction, they fell off the building and died. So there are these accidents as well. So all of these are specific uh, issues that we need to deal with on a separate basis, um, if we want to make sure that leopards and people are safe in these shared spaces. Uh, but considering the biggest issue with having leopards and people in close quarters is the fact that people are sometimes attacked and their uh, livestock like their cows and buffaloes are sometimes attacked. Uh, maybe what I said before about making people safer, making their livestock safer is a good way to move forward. Um, so to sort of summarize this part of my story, uh, leopards are extremely versatile. So they will continue to perhaps live uh, in a in variety of habitats all the way from dense forests to croplands to even big cities. Uh, I, I, and they're also very important as, you know, as predators. Uh, so I guess my, the overall point here is to constantly change how we view wildlife, because most of the time we tend to think about how wildlife only or like carnivores only live in deep jungles somewhere far, far away. Uh, that's not true. We need to sort of constantly learn um, and sort of adapt how we think about these animals and uh, what we can say about uh, what they need uh, and how to make sure that they are conserved uh, in the future uh, and also how we do that by making sure that people and their property and their livestock that is not compromised in the process of us trying to save these um, carnivores so from there i'll move on to the second uh, part of my story uh, which will focus on wild canids and hyenas so in the beginning of my talk, I, I showed you photo, some really beautiful photographs of these species. Uh, so what are canids? Canids are, uh, uh, are animals that belong to the dog family, right? Um, so India has about eight um, species or subspecies of these canids, as you can see here, Dole, Golden Jackal, Tibetan Wolf, Indian Wolf, uh, Tibetan Fox, Desert Fox, Red Fox, and Indian Fox. Along with that, I've also included the striped hyena, it's not a canid, uh, but it sort of has uh, behavior and the habitat it uses and the kind of requirements it has. It's very similar to a lot of these canids, and so I've included that here as well. Uh, the big, the problem with these canids is that we actually know very little about them in India, uh, and that sort of comes in the way of how we think about conserving them. So if I say save the Indian wolf, uh, readily, we won't be able to perhaps think about how do we save it, right? So where do we start? Do we even know enough about them to sort of go ahead and make plans about how to conserve them? So that's where we started. So I was part of a group of scientists who started Wild Canids India project. Uh, so as part of this project that we launched three years ago, two years ago, um, what we did was we did a countrywide survey using some very cool innovative techniques, right? So one, we used citizen science surveys. So we had a website uh, where people could report where they've seen these animals and, up, and send us pictures and like sort of let us know a little bit more about them and all of that. So that was one way to sort of map these animals across the country. Second, uh, we also dug through social media like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and like a whole lot of other uh, web portals where people photographers, naturalists, people who are very excited and interested in wildlife. Uh, so they go around, they, they see these animals, they click pictures, they come back, they upload them, along with some very important information about where they saw them and when they saw them, and perhaps sometimes what these animals were doing. So we sort of trawled through all of these social media platforms and uh, websites to sort of get additional information and map all these species again. Finally, we also did literature surveys. So which means that any Science, scientific article that was published about these species. We sort of extracted all of those. And then even from those um, published papers, we also mapped additionally some of these species in some of the locations. So at the end of it, uh, at the end of, uh, we did this entire exercise for about three to five months. And at the end of it, we had about 5,000 records of these nine species, subspecies uh, for India, which is probably like the biggest database about these species so far.
So first, we wanted to know how much of the area in India do these species occupy? Um, so here you can see in terms of percentages, how much of their potential habitats in India these species occupy, right? So like some species such as desert fox here on the left occupy very little area. They occur in only about 21% of the area, right? And some species like the jackal are a lot more widespread. They're found across about 75% of the entire country. So it completely varies. So now that we know where they're found, it's also sort of intuitive and relatively easy to figure out why they're found in certain places, right? So what are the habitats? What are the areas that they actually need? Um, so what we found was these canids and hyenas together need a lot of different types of habitats, uh, depending on which species it is. So for example, those or Asiatic wild dogs need dense forests. Uh, but there are species like the foxes and hyenas that need barren land, deserts, and ravines. Uh, there are species like Tibetan wolf or the red fox that need high altitude land. Um, and there are Indian foxes that do well in agricultural areas. Wolves and uh, hyenas again need scrub lands and grasslands. So basically what I'm trying to say is that generally when we think of uh, wild habitats, we generally can tend to think about forests, right? Like if it doesn't look like a green forest, we think it's a, uh, it's not really wilderness or it, it can't support wildlife. But that's not true. All of these species and a lot many other species need all of these different types of habitats to survive. So the next step of what we did was we gave uh, them uh, all, all these species grades like you get in school. So if we wanted to rank them based on how good their conservation status is, uh, we used a whole different, uh, we, we used a bunch of different things to sort of um, give them marks in some sense. So how much area they occupy, how threatened they are, is their population going up or going down, or what kind of threats they face, uh, how well protected they are according to the Indian law and international law, uh, all of these things put together, we gave each of them a grade. So for example, animals like the Tibetan wolf or the jackal are doing well because they got a B grade. Uh, none of them got an E grade, unfortunately. Uh, but then there are species like the Indian fox uh, and the high striped hyena, which got a D grade, which means that currently they're doing much worse than they can be. And we need to do a lot of things uh, in order to improve their grades, right? So that could be making sure that the populations increase, uh, their habitats are better protected, uh, their protection status improves, uh, the amount of habitat they occupy is increased and all of that. So this sort of gives a very uh, short, crisp summary about what species to focus on uh, and what we need to do in order to sort of save each, whichever species we uh, want to focus on. But what are the, what kind of threats are they facing? You know, when I spoke about uh, giving them grades based on the threats. Uh, so one major issue with most of these species is that uh, like I said before, they, they're not necessarily inside forests, right? Except for the dole, um, most of these other species occur in, in a diversity of habitats, all of which have big roads going through them. And a big problem for most of them is that they are all dying on roads because of vehicles hitting them. So while that is one issue, the second issue is that they have negative interactions with stray dogs. So now what kind of problems do they have with stray dogs? All of them are canids. So, uh, so stray dogs and these wild canids sometimes compete for the same kind of food. Uh, and there's also stray dogs have a lot of diseases that they can transfer on to these wild animals. So the, because we have so many stray dogs in the country, they will continue to survive even if some of them die because of these diseases, because we don't have as many of these wild canids, chances are that they might have negative consequences after contracting these diseases from stray dogs. So those are like two major issues. But along with that, what we also found was that jackals have a very peculiar, strange problem, like a threat going on. Um, so the first part is that uh, their tails and their skulls, so they're being poached basically because their tails and their skulls are used, are, are thought to have sort of magical properties. Uh, so it's used in ritual, uh, ritualistic, superstitious behavior. The other part is that people believe that jackals have an imaginary horn. Uh, which is locally called Nari Kombu in southern India or Siar Singhi in central and north India. So they believe that they have this horn that grows on their head. And if you sort of 
kill the jackal and take the horn and keep it with you in your house uh you know you'll get good luck and sort all sorts of superstitious beliefs so what we also found during our survey so that there this is quite a prevalent issue across most parts of india except it, there is not enough information and there's not enough focus because people think jackals are everywhere um, so it's okay uh, or like there is not enough uh, focus on on these sort of species that are very common around us so if there's like an elephant or a tiger that is poached so it gains a lot of in, uh, sort of attention from the news agencies and from the government uh, but probably for some species like the jackal because it's so common and it's everywhere um there is not enough focus and that's really unfortunate but it's definitely a threat for the for the jackal so what about their habitats how safe are they unfortunately not very safe uh because uh like i said before we tend to view only green forests that have a lot of trees as wild habitats uh these open grasslands and scrub lands and barren lands they're all viewed as wastelands by uh, government agencies Uh, so these areas are uh, they think that we need to do something with these areas so they are used for creating really large solar farms um setting up industries big infrastructure like highways airports new cities and all of that uh, and also sometimes the, the forest department itself unfortunately takes up afforestation or planting trees in these areas when they actually don't need to because these are natural habitats just the way they are even without forcing uh some tree species uh onto the habitat and most of the times they don't survive because they're not um the the ecosystem is not uh built to sort of handle these trees either so not just the the canids themselves but even their habitats are highly threatened so how exactly do we conserve these canids and their habitats and where exactly do we do it so in this map that has um state boundaries all the blue areas is what uh, are what we as scientists determined as canid conservation units so all of these blue areas approximately sort of have very high canid diversity a lot of these canids uh, and also they have a lot of uh, their habitats so conserving this this these set of areas would be very very uh, important if we want to conserve these wild canids and hyenas uh but don't we already have protected areas like national parks and sanctuaries so why not just focus on that why do we need canid conservation units right uh the thing is protected areas in india are mostly only inside forests most of them are inside forest habitats a uh, very few of those other habitats that i mentioned uh, like barren lands grasslands and scrublands and high altitude areas very few of those areas are protected So if you look at the overlap of where we have identified canid conservation units and where the protected areas are that's a very very small overlap so by using these canid conservation units we could be expanding the kind of locations and the kind of species that we are trying to conserve but because most of these canid conservation units are not inside protected forests they are out in the open where there's a lot of people there's a lot of livestock there's a lot of shared areas how do we do this so the best way to move forward is perhaps to rethink how we think about conservation right so if uh, generally what happens with uh, national parks or sanctuaries that are in forest is that we think if we just put a boundary around it and then we say that nobody can go inside over here then everything inside is going to be safe uh, but that's not possible in most of these other areas where that have a lot of people right so we need to think about how people and wild canids and hyenas and a whole other bunch of species that so, sort of share these habitats can sort of coexist in these areas uh, such that the overall area is still conserved people get to use it animals get to use it and big infrastructure projects like i mentioned big solar farms and big industries are not sort of set up in these sort of areas to outright eliminate the entire habitat and the people and the animals with them so uh, all of that is great but do india states actually have the capacity to be able to implement you know can they go ahead and declare canid conservation units it's one thing for us as scientists to say that oh this needs to be done but is that possible so here in the map you see all the yellow areas those states uh, are very important for canid conservation units so they have a lot of a lot of their area have canid conservation units that we have identified and the ones with the green and black cross marks are those states that currently don't have enough budget you know because you need money to be implementing any sort of conservation action 
So these are the states that sort of need to increase the amount of money that they have or they set aside every year to be able to declare these KNED conservation units and to sort of save uh, and to conserve uh, wild KNED and China. So like I said before, uh, India is a lot more than just uh, tigers and elephants and forests. So there's a huge bunch of species that live in such a diversity of very beautiful habitats. So we need to sort of focus a little bit more on them. So what I spoke about as part of this uh, project and whatever I spoke about in terms of wild canids, hyenas and their habitats is like a start. So we have sort of started it, but what we need is continuous monitoring. We need to do this over time. Our scientists, more scientists need to focus on these species. Uh, we need people to sort of like citizens to partake in this and not just uh, harp on wanting to save the tiger or save the elephant, but also like consider these other species which are equally beautiful, amazing, fascinating. And also we need more uh, environmentally, ecologically conscious governments because a lot of these things can only be implemented on the ground if the local government, if the state government, if the central government is interested in wanting to conserve them. Uh, so as citizens, what uh, all of you who are watching can do is head to our website wildcanids.net. So we, uh, if you have, there's a lot of information about these species. All of our research that we have done so far, we have uploaded information. There are articles that you can read, uh, ways to identify these animals. And if you've also seen these animals that you want to report, you can report your sightings and that sort of gets added to our database. And that's what we use for uh, sort of mapping them to see how their ranges have shifted and a whole bunch of things like that. So from talking about all wild canids, I'm going to now narrow down on those or the Asiatic wild dog. Uh, this is a species that I've been studying for the past eight or nine years. <clears throat> uh, so those, like I said, are, all, are actual wild species of dogs. A lot of people don't know that this is not just domestic dogs that have run away to the forest, they're actual wild species. Uh, they're found in, mostly found in forested habitats of South and Southeast Asia. Uh, there may be a couple of thousands of those left in the world. We actually don't really know the exact number, uh, but there's so few that uh, the IUCN, uh, which is a global body that determines the conservation status of these species, they have categorized it as an endangered species. It basically means that it's a species that requires immediate attention uh, to conserve their population. So again, remember I mentioned multiple times when we say save the animal or like save the tiger or save the elephant, what exactly do we mean? Like how do we do it? So where do we begin? What are the questions? What are the answers we need so that we can take the steps to do that, right? So first, let's get a global perspective. Let's figure out what exactly those are doing in different parts of their range. Uh, but me as one person, as one scientist, can't obviously travel everywhere and look at everything and try to study all the locations where those are, right? Um, so that would be slightly impossible. So what I can do instead is look at all the scientific information and other information that has been published in different parts of the world. So that's what I did. Uh, I did a meta-analysis or a meta-analysis basically means you take everything that's published and then you extract information from these things like scientific papers, um, journal articles, uh, hunters journals, everything, and then you sort of Ask, ask research questions and then you answer them, right? So that's what I did with Sol. Uh, and then to get this global perspective, the first thing I wanted to know is what exactly do they eat in the different parts where they occur? Remember I told you that they're found in South and Southeast Asia. So this map of South and Southeast Asia uh, and the colored parts are basically where those are mostly found. Um, the different colors indicate the different regions where they're found. So for example, blue is South India, green is Central India, Yellow is northeastern region that includes uh, Nepal, Bhutan, and northeast India, and the pink is Southeast Asia. Uh, so, by looking at all the studies that have been published about Dhol diet, which basically which looks at what they eat in individual locations, so all the black dots are individual studies. So they've all done one study at a time. So I put all of them together to figure out what they're eating in different parts of the world, right? So while those are mostly eating wild herbivores like deer and gore, um, there's different levels to which they're consuming these different species, right? So for example, in South India, they're eating a lot more deer species compared to the other locations. In Central India, they're eating a lot more monkeys and primates 
compared to other locations. In the northeastern region, they're eating a lot more livestock, cattle, domestic animals, compared to the other regions. And in Southeast Asia, they're eating a lot more small mammals and rodents compared to the other locations. So they are eating livestock in some places, but why do they eat livestock? Don't they live in, don't those just live in forests? So they should just be eating wild prey, right? Like, like sambar deer, spotted deer, gaur. Uh, why do they eat livestock? So when we did this analysis, what we found was they generally in, eat livestock in those locations where there's a lot of livestock available. So if there's higher density of livestock close to the protected area where those live, they tend to eat them more. But they also eat livestock more in those locations that have a lot of prey animals along with a lot of competition for these prey animals, right? So when there's a lot of prey and then there's also a lot of tigers and a lot of leopards, and tigers and leopards are also competing with doles for the same kind of prey animals, that's when doles seem to be forced to be eating uh, livestock, right? So they eat livestock in some places, they don't eat livestock in some places, and this is why we think they might be eating livestock in certain locations. So fine, but when does this actually become conflict? So just because they're eating cows and buffaloes in some places, does that, does that mean that there's conflict on, in these locations? Not necessarily. So when we wanted to find out when it becomes conflict or a negative interaction, uh, we found that people just generally th thought of those as uh, livestock depredators in locations where they ate more livestock, not usually when they ate very little livestock in any location. And they also viewed them negatively. People viewed those negatively uh, when in locations where the packs were smaller, which probably means that if it's a really large pack, they were unlikely to go outside the forest to eat the livestock. But if it's a smaller pack, maybe they were going and eating these animals and these cows and buffalo. Um, and the third reason when, uh, as to why people would view those negatively is if that location just generally had a lot of potentially dangerous carnivores. So if you had a lot of carnivores like bears and snow leopards and tigers and leopards, all of which people may be scared of, uh, so, and those were also there, so people just probably generally felt uh, scared and negatively about all of these species, and those just happened to be one of them, right? So how, from a global perspective, if you want to make decisions on how to save the dole globally, right? So how, how do we do that? Um, sorry. Uh, so in South and Central India, where the amount of cows and buffaloes that doles eat is very low, uh, there the government can continue paying compensation to people who lose their animals to those, right? Because it's not that many, it happens once in a while. In the Northeast region, Nepal, Bhutan, and Northeast India, where this happens on a more regular basis, it can't be a compensation-based mechanism. So there it needs to be more proactive. So by creating insurance schemes, for example, where people participate in sort of putting some money aside in case something goes wrong, like in case they lose cattle, that way they can get the money and also improving their husbandry practices. So building better shelters, taking care of their animals better. Maybe that's a way to sort of make sure that uh, people's animals are safe and those are also conserved and there is no retaliatory killing. Uh, and in Southeast Asia, where those there are not that many livestock to begin with. There are not that many cows and buffaloes in Southeast Asia as they are in India and Nepal, Bhutan. Uh, and therefore, in these areas, maybe it's best to sort of focus on how to improve prey numbers so that those numbers can also go up alongside. So that is sort of like a vague takeaway from all of these, uh, from a global perspective. So now let's zoom in on India. India is definitely one of the most, like it's the most important range country for those because India has more those compared to any other country where those occur. Uh, but within India, where exactly are those found, right? Uh, so they're actually found in three key landscapes. One is the Western Ghats in the south, um, the Central Indian forest, and in Northeast India. And if you look at it from a state level perspective, uh, Karnataka actually ranks really, really high because a lot of Karnataka forests are occupied by those. Um, and also they're doing pretty well in the state. Not that other states are not as good, but Karnataka sort of tops the list according to our research. Um, so how exactly do we improve the status of doles in India? So the first thing to do, the, there are two immediate things that can be done. One is to expand forest cover because those really need forests. And in the map that you see above, 
the green areas are the locations where we think improving forest cover is going to be better for those. And the second part of it is to increase dole populations, right? So those are the red areas that we have identified, some of it in Central India and most of it in Northeast India. These are the locations where by improving prey numbers, you can also increase the populations of dole uh, by increasing for protection levels and all of these things. So, but as conservationists, we don't just want them to increase in numbers just where they're already found, but we also want them to expand to other areas where perhaps they were once found long ago. So where else can they expand their range to? So what we found was that all of these blue locations uh, in the map at the bottom are locations where there is some potential for those to occupy, right? And what is really fascinating is that uh, the location that I'm showing here in the in the northern part of Western Ghat in Gujarat, after we uh, did this analysis, we found that those have come back over here in the location where we identified as very high potential, uh, and also in this one location in Tamil Nadu as well. So, uh, so this is basically to show that the locations that we identify are in, in this blue color are likely very good uh, for those to sort of expand their range and to sort of colonize. Uh, they probably occurred in these areas once upon a time, but they've gone locally extinct right now, but they can sort of recolonize these areas uh, moving on to the future. Um, but you remember when I spoke about the wild canids, I said it's not just enough for us as scientists and conservationists to say that, oh, we need to save the animals. There should also be some amount of uh, interest from the perspective of the governments, and they should have the capacity to implement these as well, right? Uh, so if you think about it from that perspective, uh, where all can these animals, so what are the states that can actually invest, right? So for this, we want to, if we, this is a completely different set of um, uh, sort of requirements that the states have. This has nothing to, this has very little to do with the ecology or the animals themselves. Um, so here we are talking about things like the GDP or how much budget they have or how much poverty levels they have, what is their rate of giving clearances to forests and all of that. So putting all of those things together, this map sort of shows which states have high capacity and which states have low capacity. And then if you put all of those things together, we were able to sort of figure out at the India level, what states have very high priority and very high capacity to conserve those. And again, a mixed match of priority and capacities. And this map basically is like a way for us to move forward, thinking about how exactly and where to focus and where, where uh, is it easy to sort of implement conservation strategies for those. Now moving into Karnataka, like focusing a little bit uh, deeper into Karnataka. Uh, so here, where exactly do we, how do we map them? How do we know where they're found, right? So here, when we walk around the forest, along these uh, forest roads, uh, we generally find the poop or their track marks, uh, because most of the time it's not easy to see those, right? So we, uh, using these indirect signs, we are, we are able to sort of map them across uh, large areas. Here in the map, the dark lines essentially represent the protected areas and the greens are all forest. So while walking around in these areas, we can sort of map where they're found uh, and also figure out how much area they occupy. So this is just a picture of what it looks like, uh, walking around looking for their signs. So what has changed in Karnataka over time? The amount of area that those occupy has reduced from about 62% in 2007 to about 54% uh, in 2015. So that's a big dip within a very short amount of time. Uh, so that's sad, but where exactly are those found? They're found in locations that have a lot of prey animals and they're avoiding areas that have a lot of livestock in, in Karnataka. Uh, so if I'm saying that the amount of area they occupied went down, why did it go down? Uh, and where exactly did they go down? It's usually in areas that have lost forest cover. So if you if there is deforestation, those have also gone away from those areas. But where are they safe? Where did they continue to live from 2007 to 2015? These are all in the protected areas. So if they were protected areas in those areas, those somewhat remained intact, they remained safe. So using all of this information, what exactly can we recommend for Karnataka? So the light blue areas over here are all the locations that are very important for the for us to save the habitats. So if we conserve the habitats over here, those have a better chance of sort of expand, sort of dispersing, moving around and all of that. And the dark blue areas here in the map are locations 
uh, where we need to increase protection efforts. So make sure that uh, those don't go away from these areas because that would be really, really detrimental for the species. So after the Karnataka level, if we zoom in a little bit more into just one protected area, which is Vainar Sanctuary in Kerala. Uh, so what are the questions we can ask at this very small scale, right? Uh, one of the most important things that we need to do is to monitor any animal that is endangered or threatened, right? Because we want to see how, how many of them they are there, how many of them are there, uh, how do these numbers vary over time and all of that. Usually for tigers and leopards, uh, we put camera traps because they all have unique patterns on their body and it's easy to identify individuals. But for those, you can't use camera traps and photographs because they all pretty much look the same. So how exactly do we count how many those there are? We again go back to their poop. So we go around these forests, picking up their poop and extracting their DNA from their poop. And then using this information, we're able to assign individuals, right? So we know which poop belongs to which animal and therefore we give them sort of ID cards. So with the, this information, we can kind of figure out how many doles there are. So here are pictures. So like I said, walking around in the forest, then we find the poop, we very carefully uh, collect the poop and then we bring it to the lab and then we identify which poop belongs to which animal. So in Vainad, it seems like those are doing really well. Some of the locations had, uh, our statistical models indicated that some locations had very high numbers of doles and some other locations had very low numbers of doles. And we were able to do this using, uh, not having seen most of these doles, but just using their poop and looking at their DNA. So moving forward, what exactly can we do with this, right? So uh, that was just from one year, like in 2019, with the, uh, the, the map that I showed you. But doing this over time will tell us how this number changes over time. And by doing the same kind of study in different parts of India and everywhere else, we can see how the numbers change across space. So putting these two things together, we're able to, I guess, better monitor locations where those are doing well, where they're not doing well, and therefore figure out how to save them in different places. Yeah, and this was basically part of my uh, PhD work. Uh, all, all the things related to those that I spoke about was part of my PhD. And pretty much everything that I spoke about till right now has all been published in scientific uh, journals. Uh, but what I showed you was like a very small snapshot of it, like a summary using cartoons, but they're all obviously scientific um, research questions that have been answered and published. Uh, why is it important to sort of use these cartoons? Um, uh, most of the time what happens as scientists is that we forget how to communicate what we find out, such cool things that we find out uh, to audience that are not part of the community, right? Uh, so it's very important to sort of break down the science uh, and sort of communicate it with people who are not well versed with the kind of language that we are used to. So here, for example, the cartoons that I've made are being used by my colleague, Dr. Vidya Atreya, who's a very renowned leopard biologist. Uh, she's using these cartoons to sort of educate journalists and media personnel about how to report on uh, leopard related incidents, right? Um, so this is another elephant related cartoon that I have made that has been translated into Canada and it's been used in many workshops for training. Um, this is another cartoon version of uh, best practices to avoid uh, negative interactions with tiger that I made, which has been displayed in uh, a forest department building outside in, uh, in, in central India. Um, so with all of this, I'm going to uh, end my talk, which I think went a little over the time limit. Uh, I thank all of these institutions for um, sort of supporting all the work that I've done. All the photographs that you saw, most of those beautiful ones all belong to these wonderful photographers. I thank them for the amazing uh, pictures they've captured. And thank you all for listening to me. Um, and you can get in touch with me uh, separately. And I, I'm happy to interact with all of you on social media or on email or visit my website. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Arjun. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'd like to open it up for questions. Uh, I guess we can start with this one. Um, there's a question, uh, uh, at what stage or what factors would lead the government to kill carnivores? Do you think there's any of that actually happening, Arjun? Uh, very rarely because, uh, I mean, the good thing about India is that I think the citizens at large still really, really uh, connect very deeply with a lot of wildlife. 
Uh, so generally, even even irrespective of whether you're from a big city that's campaigning for a tiger or like you know from the rural areas, generally uh, the demand to kill them is very very low. Uh, usually, even people local people who are uh, affected by conflict want the forest department to catch the animal and move it somewhere else. Um, so killing is usually seen as a very very last option in India at least right now. Lethal killing is not as common. For carnivores, but uh, herbivores like wild boars and nilgai that regularly raid crops, um, elephants, uh, for example, uh, then there is a, I guess, a lot more constant uh, negative interaction with people. I guess people feel slightly differently about some of these things. You're muted, Uma. Are there any questions on YouTube, or um, we can go ahead with some other questions otherwise? Uh, you can go ahead with other questions, Uma. Okay, so uh, so Arjun, I was just wondering about um, you know a lot of the these recommendations that you've come up with uh, are in papers and things like that, and you're doing a lot of communication about uh, the biology and things like that. But uh, how do you think? I mean, I know it's a very hard question, but how do you think? What is the way to get these um, actually incorporated in uh, future plans and um, future of these landscapes? And so this is, uh, yeah, like you said, this is also something that I have been grappling with a lot because as just as scientists, we're all, already wearing so many hats, uh, trying to do the science and also to trying to communicate and to make sure that like it's accessible and everything, but uh, to also take up act, like policy, activism and all of that might be a stretch for me personally. Uh, but definitely uh, what we are trying to explore, at least with the wild KNS project that we have done, is to try and convert these into policy documents submitted to state and national boards for wildlife uh, to see if at least that way we can say that this is what we have done, this is what we recommend. But actual implementation, of course, will completely be the, in the court of the government. It, it, it's really not up to us when it comes to that level. Yeah. Great. So there's there's a question uh, from YouTube. Are dole the same as wild dogs? Of course. Yes. Yeah. They are. Yes. Yeah. And, but uh, there are also African wild dogs, which are featured a lot more frequently on like Nat Geo, uh, Animal Planet, and all of that. But the Asian species is the Asiatic wild dog, also called the dole. So what is the uh, dole's geographic range? I thought it was only uh, located in India. Um, uh, so obviously you showed that's yeah India India definitely we think has the highest number of doles uh, and also the highest amount of area occupied uh, but they're also found in Nepal Bhutan uh, Burma Thailand so South and Southeast Asia mostly they were in, long ago they were found all the way from southern part of Russia Mongolia China and all of that but China still has some doles but mostly right now it's South Southeast Asia so there's also a question about other predators uh, in Karnataka other than doles so maybe you could highlight something about uh, the other predators in Karnataka, which are uh, important for conservation. All predators are important for conservation. Uh, yeah, but Karnataka actually, uh, again, like not many people may know this, but uh, has a very amazing diversity. Uh, a lot of sm small carnivores that we hardly talk about because of course we have tiger, leopard, sloth, bear, dole, bull, fox, striped hyena. We have all of these things. These are all the bigger ones. But we also have a whole set of like mongooses and martins and civets and you know there's a huge diversity of them yeah and across a wide spectrum of landscapes across the state. So um, um, another question, you know, the the um, methods you used in terms of literature survey meta analyses seem to highlight many uh, aspects of biology uh, of these species. Uh, which which seem really important for understanding their future. Uh, yet many biologists would say that you know the way to study species biology is to really you know go into the field, you know collar animals, catch them, watch them uh, for years and years and years uh, to you know understand these things. So how do you think that you know um, so these are kind of different approaches? But I'm wondering what your thoughts are on you know is one better than the other? Uh, you know, or have you have you felt that there were certain gaps uh, because of the meta analyses? Uh, you know, just to highlight for the audience that different approaches to science are possible because it seems like this is so much easier, right? To 
uh, better, so much better to just do these meta analyses and then, you know, um, go ahead. So there are two parts to it. One is just like, not just meta analysis, but also like statistical models that we as scientists really like. So a lot of it can just happen by sitting in front of a computer. You can simulate population, see how they move and all of those things. But I guess the link between our understanding of what the species is and, and that definitely, at least according to me, comes from being in the field, observing them, reading a lot about them, not from a science perspective, but from a natural history perspective. So there are so many old journal hunters records and all of that that speak about behaviors about these species. The second thing is also what we can borrow from general understanding of other carnivores or other species that are related. So a lot of the times we don't have the luxury of knowing everything about the species that we want to study, but some related species either in the US or in Europe, it's because they have a longer history of wildlife research, we can borrow some ideas and test them using these different tools. Uh, but I would definitely vouch for a combination wherein like you have to have some field knowledge spend time, know what you're talking about, uh, sort of get a feel for the habitat and the species, then there is more credibility, I guess, in the kind of questions you can ask to do a statistical, just purely based on statistics or meta-analysis. Okay, there's a couple of questions and then I think Mahin has a question, but we'll just go through these first. This question is from Mahesh Shankaran. If an ecosystem loses its tolls, what might be the knock-on effects of this on the rest of the ecosystem? Are, are they important players in natural ecosystems at their current densities? So that's a little difficult to answer because uh, very few uh, in India, at least I can focus on the rest of the countries. It's not very, uh, we don't have enough information to sort of say anything, but at least in India, I can speak slightly more confidently that most of the locations that have doles also have tigers uh, because they've sort of survived incidentally benefiting from the kind of conservation efforts that have been invested in uh, conserving the tiger. So I can't offhand just sort of wager a guess about what kind of ecosystem effect it can have because I don't think we've seen anything directly. One example I can give from Bhutan, for example, where there were, the apex predator was largely the toll. Uh, they had a huge uh, spike in wild pig numbers when those were eliminated. So they had conflict with those. So they decided to eliminate the those in the late 80s and the early 90s. The white pig numbers shot up completely and the kind of crop damage that people faced went up a lot. So they started reintroducing the dole in the same area and then the wild pig numbers came down and came back under control. So that is one sort of like a, not experimental, but I guess sort of observationally experimental uh, information that we have. But within India, I don't know when you have a multi carnivore system Specifically, and what about the their densities? Area. You know, given their current densities, do you think they're having effects independent of, uh, you know, tigers and leopards? I guess I, I, it's hard for me to say because yeah, because we don't know what their densities are. I mean, we could guess, but I don't. I, I can't. Uh, okay. I, I don't know how to answer that. Okay. There's a, another question from Anandita Puri. Uh, basically, she says, "Great talk. Uh, Dholes are were frequently hunted." Uh, were frequently hunting livestock for food, but later in your talk, you showed how they started to avoid the places where active uh, livestock with active livestock activity. Uh, what caused this conflicting shift? No, so the first part that I spoke about was from a global perspective. They eat livestock in some places, and they don't eat livestock in some places on a regular basis. Uh, in Karnataka, which is in South India, in the Western Ghat. There's very little livestock depredation by those to begin with because we think it's because there is uh, adequate prey and there's sort of very good protection levels and all of that. Um, so these two things are sort of complementary in terms of information about those. It's not over time it has changed. It's just in some locations like the Northeastern region, Nepal, Bhutan, Northeast India, there's a lot more livestock consumption by those. In Central and South India, it's just not as much. And in the Western parts of Karnataka, our results showed that mostly they're avoiding, actively avoiding areas that have a lot of cattle activity. So they're not pursuing it, but once in a while they might still eat it. So that's, and it's a difference of scale and location and also how frequently they might be eating livestock. There's another, Mahin, you want to ask your question? And then I'll go to the YouTube questions. Sorry, this is Chandrakant. Oh, Chandrakant, sorry, go ahead. So, um, 
Uh, yes. So the my question is that um, again concerning we had a conversation about you know the wild dogs and uh, the wolves in Saswad, uh, which you touched upon, and uh, you know how the conservation is important. Now, um, since I am in that area, uh, I know for a fact that you know the conservation and the protection of these wild dogs have not come anywhere in any conversation that I have had on the ground with builders with friends with family or any of the landowners in that area um, you know even though the wild dogs in in my area are under threat because of the because of the airport construction now is there a way uh, in which and there are obviously people working on on the you know on the wolves and the wild dogs is there a way for people to actually communicate and work with uh, scientists uh, you know such as uh, arjun um, so that we can have conservation measures and you know conversations on the ground, which which the people are having, because like because I'm from that place and I know none of this is actually even in part of the conversation. You know, there is if the airport happens or not happens, it's got nothing to do with with the conservation in the area right now, unfortunately, and that's very sad. Um, so how is how can this gap with the people and the decision makers? be bridged, uh, you know, uh, with the conservationists. Uh, that I would really love to know that. Um, yeah. So there are two parts to this. So I, I will give you the easier answer. <laughs> the, the more difficult one is that it's a, the, the dynamics are a lot more complicated because um, this has things like EIA involved and the government bodies are involved. And usually that's done on consultancy basis with some other external agency, which may or may not be scientifically very sound, the reports that they produce. And that is the one that will be heard in, in tribunals and courts and all of that. So a lot of there is, I agree that there is like uh, lots of gaps in the connections that we have. But as citizens, when you sort of partake in discussions, uh, in consultations with these local hearings and in, and in the discussions about like the social impacts and the environmental impacts, I guess a good way to do it is that as scientists, we should do a better job, of course, of putting out this information in, in not just scientific papers, but in articles that are more accessible, more easy to understand, sort of break it down, uh, which I guess right now, a lot more scientists are doing than before. Uh, so if you re if you go through uh, Ground Glass Sustain or Conservation India, uh, Nature in Focus, all of these different web portals host a lot of really nice articles that Sanctuary Asia, for example, all of these um, outlets have uh, articles written by scientists now, not just journalists, but scientists who are also making an effort. Uh, I guess as citizens, it's also like part responsibility to seek out and find this information. So if you find out that you want to partake in something, just Google. So all of this is like very easily available right now on social media. People keep sharing. Follow the pages of these different magazines and outlets. Uh, you will definitely get alerts. Subscribe to those um, their email list and they will let you know. There will be online petitions. Um, so I guess it's not just what's the responsibility of us as a scientist, but also like every other party involved as well. Thanks, Arjun. There's Thank a you. couple more questions from YouTube. Um, excellent presentation, Arjun. Is there any place with high negative interaction specifically with respect to dholes and not other animals? And how do people slash managers deal with this? Right now, I don't know readily of any place. I mean, just by anecdotally knowing, I think Northeast India definitely has a lot of negative interactions with uh, between people and dholes because the other carnivores are not there in as as high numbers as dholes are. Uh, but uh, yeah, and in most cases, so there's also this other problem that uh, in a lot of places where historically dholes have been viewed as vermin, they think they're pests of the jungle. Uh, a lot of forest managers still hold this notion uh, and they also think that uh, those are a threat to tigers. So now with so much focus on wanting to bring the tiger back in so many protected areas where they have probably gone extinct, you know, in, the, in recent times, uh, people think that just because there are those, managers think that just because there are those, tigers will not come back here out of fear, which is not true. If there is adequate prey, our research in, uh, in the Western Ghats shows that if there's enough protection, if there's enough prey, the two species can actually coexist in decent numbers. Uh, but yeah, there is a sort of like a perception related issue with those as well. Um, and I would think that Northeast India, not sort of singling it out, but I think based on anecdotal information, that's what I can say. 
I think there's another question from YouTube, which is kind of similar to Mahesh's. It's in the sense that it says uh, by uh, Venkatesh saying that, you know, with global warming species getting lost and getting evolved, how do you see the food chain changing? Is it possible for herbivores and omnivores to be transformed in the future? That's a, very, <laughs> that's a fascinating question, but also a much bigger evolutionary question. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if I have the sort of expertise to answer that directly but also a lot of the things that we keep immediately think of when we say for uh, like protection and conservation and get, we're normally thinking of forests but i think the kind of changes that it can have in arid systems in dry grasslands and deserts i think that would likely be more pronounced but i guess like slight some forest systems may be slightly more resilient compared to some of these other very water reliant areas like deserts and arid, and we know very little about these sort of ecosystems at least I know very little about it to sort of comment. So I, don't, I, I can't, I, I, that would be very interesting to find out for myself. Also. Yeah. So I think we'll just end with the last question actually from South Amini, where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is the outside in. And I think all of us in this pandemic have felt quite constrained being inside more than outside. So just out of curiosity, uh, you know, can you narrate uh, a very fascinating incident you have had, experience that you have had uh, in the wild, uh, something you've experienced, uh, which you would like to share? Uh, very quickly, I will talk about the first, and I guess the only time I've seen a pack of doles hunting down uh, a deer, a spotted deer. So this happened in Bandipur uh, about seven years ago. Uh, early in the morning, we heard loud alarm calls of the langur, uh, and then we all ran out to see what was happening. And a pack of seven or eight doles right in front of our camp uh, they were sort of trying to bite chunks off of the spotted deer. That was the first time outside of a documentary that I, I was seeing it because I'd only seen it a couple of times in these uh, documentaries and read about them extensively in, in Dr. AJT Johnson's thesis and in Michael Fox's uh, book about these animals back from the 70s. So it was really fascinating for me to see that within 15 minutes, there was really nothing left of the spotted deer. The dolls had cleaned them up fully. And within like two minutes of this entire thing happening, there were vultures all around. No idea how they sort of sense these things and then come to sort of like feed on the bones and stuff. It was a fascinating, like a movie playing within 15, 20 minutes to just see all of these things. Yeah, I guess <laughs> now, now I miss, miss being outdoors all the more. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, Arjun Saudamini. Would you like to conclude with a thank you? Yes, yeah, uh, th th that was a very interesting story. And uh, thanks to Arjun for uh, conveying the concepts about uh, carnivores and how they also need their space. Uh, plus, uh, I noted that almost all your slides are very interesting cartoons. And uh, they seem to be a very powerful way of communicating the concepts. Uh, so we appreciate that. And uh, thanks to Uma for uh, identifying this uh, very interesting topic and uh, uh, powerful way of uh, communication by the speaker. And uh, also for co-hosting uh, this uh, uh, talk with me. And uh, thanks to NCBS and the communications team, uh, Mahin Chandrakan Pavitra for supporting the session as ever. And thanks to the audience, all of you for coming on a Sunday morning and that too during the festival, as Mahin was mentioning. And uh, I hope uh, you have enjoyed the session as much as we have. And with this, once again, I would like to thank the speaker and the co-host. And uh, also, yeah, we will see you next week, same time, 11 a.m. Please take care, all of you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. You. Thanks all. Bye.